Today, I'm going to explain an Argentinian crime thriller film called The Heist of the Century. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. Fernando Araujo lives a decent life as an artist and a judo instructor. However, he's not satisfied and thinks that he's still on the lookout for his calling. One night, on his way back home, he stops for a smoke as it rains heavily. After Fernando is done, he discards the cigarette, which slowly drifts away and falls into a sewer near the bank of Rio. Curious, he goes down the sewer and suddenly, a crazy idea crosses his mind. The following day, Fernando goes to meet his civil engineer friend Sebastian and prepares poses the idea of robbing the bank. It turns out Sebastian is financially struggling, so he's open to the idea, but he estimates that the plan would require cars, tools, and lots of money. Therefore, Fernando starts looking for a funder and meets his other friend named De Bauza. Unfortunately, the latter is also short on money, so he suggests Fernando go to his thief friend, Mario. Since when is Mario friends with De Bauza? Oh, God. The scene then cuts to Mario, who breaks into an office at night and immaculately steals money from a safe. He doesn't even appear worried throughout the ordeal, indicating that minor robberies like these are a piece of cake for him. The next day, Fernando meets Mario at a cafe and explains his idea. The master thief is initially disinterested, but Fernando convinces him by saying that if they pull off the heist, he would never have to steal again. Fernando then drives him to the same location and lowers a measuring tape inside the manhole, right outside the bank. He also takes takes Mario down to the sewers to find the bottom of the tape. After some calculation, Fernando announces that they are 18 meters away from becoming millionaires. In the next scene, Fernando, Mario, and De Bauza gather to discuss the heist further. They plan to dig a tunnel into the bank, but all of the rooms inside have motion sensors. However, Fernando says that motions don't detect movements. They only identify changes in temperature. Therefore, he has made a suit out of a sleeping bag, which can help them disguise their body temperature. Now, the only problem is that he doesn't know how to open the bank vault. So, the following day, the group decides to investigate some more. Fernando takes pictures of the bank's parking lot situated behind the building before going inside with Sebastian. The latter pretends to open an account while Fernando takes pictures of the foyer. Unfortunately, he is soon caught and the security arrives. Fernando quickly tries to leave, but the security apprehends him and escorts him to the basement for questioning. Surprisingly, this was all part of the plan. Fernando uses this opportunity to closely observe the safe deposit box room. Meanwhile, the security check all of his belongings, including the camera, but they do not find any evidence and reluctantly let him go. It's then revealed that Fernando had managed to remove the memory card of the camera, but for some reason security didn't find that suspicious at all. Later, Fernando and Sebastian draw up the bank's floor plan using the pictures and their memory. Fernando then hatches a plan to break into the bank from the small room. Next, they measure the distance between the manhole and the bank, using a bicycle by calculating the number of times the tire rotates. The next day, Fernando uses his knowledge of geometry to calculate the angle at which they must dig up the tunnel to reach the bank. It's also revealed that the money the group is set to steal is insured, so no one except the bank will have to incur a loss because of them. Later that night, Fernando and the others go into the sewer and start digging up the tunnel. The following day, they hire another guy named Alberto, who is set to take care of the getaway car. Fernando and the group are yet to find a way to open 400 lockers. They initially consider using a blowtorch, but it would take them one and a half minutes per box and seven hours in total. Therefore, Fernando suggests renting a locker and studying it closely, but from another branch of the bank. The following day, Mario goes to another branch of the same bank and rents a safety deposit box. While opening it, he closely watches the lock. Next, Mario and his accomplice steal a getaway van and wait for Alberto outside his home. Shortly after, they are approached by police. The duo panics thinking that they are going to be caught. But fortunately, Alberto and his wife arrive and tell the officer that they are friends. The group continues digging the tunnel, and one day they meet with an accident and break the drill. Fernando brushes the incident aside and plans to buy a new drill, but this infuriates Mario as he has already invested a lot of money in the project. Later that night, Fernando visits his girlfriend and they gaze at the stars together. They talk about how they are looking at the past of the stars, as the light takes years to reach Earth. We think they exist, but they 
are gone. This suddenly gives Fernando an idea, and he immediately heads to Mario's home. Fernando tells him that he has found the solution. He says that the bank is well protected when it is both open and closed, but the measures are different. The bank has good security measures to prevent cash theft and good protocols to avoid the tunnel heist. However, they don't have a measure to prevent them both from happening at the same time. Fernando plans to enter the bank from the front during work hours when the safety vault is open, thus avoiding alarm and motion sensors. This will give the cops an impression that they are small-time thieves who are after petty cash. Fernando wants to make everyone believe that they are planning to leave from the front door so that the cops won't even suspect a tunnel escape. Hearing all this, Mario is delighted, and he absolutely loves the idea. You got all that from looking at the stars, man? <laughs> she. The scene then cuts to the day of the heist. Everyone applies glue to their fingers to hide their fingerprints. Sebastian is dropped by the sewer, and he goes inside to do his work, while Fernando and the others enter the bank in a disguise before putting on their masks. Shortly after, Mario and DeBauza head to the first floor, while Fernando and Alberto take over the ground floor. At the same time, they pull out their weapons and order everyone to lay on the ground. A security guard watches it transpire from the CCTV room and immediately alerts the police. It's then revealed that Fernando Fernando is overhearing the communication from his walkie-talkie. Mario orders the cashier to load the money into a bag, while Alberto goes to lock the parking gate. The police eventually arrive outside, and seeing this, Fernando holds a civilian at gunpoint. He then threatens to kill the man if the police try to storm into the bank. Following this, Fernando returns inside and informs his accomplices that the first phase has been completed. As soon as Mario hears this, he holds a woman at gunpoint and orders the security guard in the CCTV room to surrender himself. The guard reluctantly obliges, and Mario seizes his gun's magazine and mobile phone before releasing him outside. Next, the group disables all the cameras in the bank. Fernando goes to the small room and moves a cabinet. From the other side, Sebastian breaks the wall and enters the bank through the tunnel. The two then fetch some equipment from their car, head to the vault, and start assembling the machine. A flashback then reveals that Sebastian had built a cannon power machine, which can break the lock within seven seconds. Next, everyone sets a time on their watches as Sebastian and Fernando start to break into all the lockers. Meanwhile, the police, media, and the relatives of the hostages gather outside the bank. The police captain speaks to the security guard and gets to know about the situation inside. Elsewhere, as Fernando and Sebastian continue to break open the lockers, suddenly they hear the police climbing on the roof. Mario then gets the captain's call on the guard's phone which he had taken earlier. A flashback reveals that Fernando had also prepared for this scenario, so he made Mario practice the art of negotiation. Don't do it! Let me go! Back in the present, Mario speaks to the captain, I'm gonna negotiate, and orders him to remove all the forces from the terrace, threatening to kill the civilians. I'll do it! The captain obliges, but he covertly sends two snipers on the neighboring building. He then asks Mario about his demands, and the latter tells him that he wants to speak to the district attorney. The captain agrees to fulfill his demand, and requests one hour of time from him. Meanwhile, Fernando and Sebastian have already unlocked a lot of lockers, recovering tons of cash, gold, and other precious ornaments. Outside, the police assess the situation. There are only two ways to enter the bank, from the main gate and the parking lot. However, they do not know anything about the location of the hostages. They also conclude that it is simply an attempted robbery. After a while, the captain again gets on a call with Mario and asks him to surrender. He says that the burglars haven't hurt anyone yet, so they will get away with a light sentence. The captain also offers to find him a lawyer. In response, Mario says that he will discuss it with his accomplices. All this while, Fernando and Sebastian break into more lockers, while the police wait outside helplessly. Just then, an old hostage's phone starts to ring, and it's revealed that it's her birthday today. <laughs> Happy birthday. But shut up or I'll kill you. Mario then wishes her a happy birthday while DeBauza takes a chocolate from another hostage and gives it to her. The snipers watch them celebrate the woman's birthday and relay the information back to the captain, surprising him. Meanwhile, Mario sets the woman free as a birthday present. And because her name was Peach, he then leans against a window and tells the captain that he has spent 15 years in prison and that he will only surrender if the DA assures him that he will get a light sentence. Upon hearing this, the captain orders the sniper to hold back and 
Mario gets away from the window. It's then revealed that he was actually testing if the police would shoot him. Soon the DA arrives and speaks with Mario. Surprisingly, the latter starts hurling abuses at the DA and refuses to talk with him. Mario then demands to speak with his lawyer instead. However, when the captain asks for the lawyer's number, Mario gives him the phone number of a hostage. He then changes his phone and speaks to the DA as his fake lawyer. In this way, he buys his burglar friends some more time. Next, Mario holds up all the hostages on the first floor, while Fernando and others finally start transporting their loot through the tunnel. Mario then switches off his mobile phone, and this makes the captain doubt if he is really serious about surrendering. Just then, he notices the manhole and figures out that the burglars have found an alternate way to escape. Meanwhile, after loading the loot on the boats, Fernando leaves all the weapons in the vault for the police. A flashback then reveals that all the weapons are actually children's toys because Fernando didn't want to hurt any civilians. Finally, Mario leaves the hostages on the first floor and joins Fernando in the small room. As soon as he does so, all the scared hostages pick up their phones and call their relatives outside. The captain also sends a troop into the sewer while another one storms into the bank from the front. Fernando and Mario quickly clear all the evidence of the tunnel and join the others in the boat. Another flashback reveals that Fernando had also anticipated the police finding out about the sewer. Therefore, they had already built a dam to increase the water level, which would allow them to go in the opposite direction on a motorboat. <laughs> what? Elsewhere, the captain reaches the small room and eventually the tunnel opening, where a bomb is blocking the entrance. However, he soon learns that the bomb, along with the weapons, is fake. Unfortunately for the captain, it's too late, as the thieves have already managed to escape. Meanwhile, Fernando and the group flee the scene in their getaway vehicle and destroy all their gears. They then head to Alberto's house and divide the loot equally amongst themselves. Several months have now passed, and the group appears to be enjoying their best lives. However, one day, Alberto's wife catches him cheating on her. This infuriates her so much that she reports him to the police, exposing him as one of the thieves in the bank heist. Hell hath no fury, man. As a result, one by one, all of the thieves are arrested. Alberto doesn't know how to keep it zipped. The movie again fast forwards seven months into the future. Fernando is released from the prison, and he is welcomed by Mario in his luxury car. It's then revealed that Fernando had also prepared for a scenario in which they got caught. He purposely suggested that they use toy weapons so that they don't hurt anyone and get away with lighter sentences. Fernando and others also get to keep a significant portion of their loot because the bank doesn't keep records of the money and items kept in the safety deposit boxes. The bank estimated that the lockers stored 25 million worth of cash and jewelry, but the police only recovered 1.17 million and 8 kilograms of jewelry. Since there was no official record of the items in the lockers, the police couldn't pursue a strong case against the criminals, and they basically got away with only a slap on the wrist. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.